This is Lab 3, Part 1, and we're going to learn the parts of the heart and some of the arteries and the veins. By now in lecture and in lab, you should have learned the electrical pathway of the heart going from the sinoatrial node, that's your called your pacemaker, and it depolarizes and it causes the atria to contract. And then the signal goes to the AV node, the atrioventricular node. Then it goes down the septum through the bundle of His, and then on down through the bundle branches, and then it comes back up and around the heart through the Purkinje fibers, and that causes the ventricle to contract. And then you start the whole process again. So you should know the path of the electrical propagation through the heart and bundle of his, Purkinje fibers, these should be familiar to you. Now, you can listen to this and you get a lub-dub sound as the valves are opening and closing, but you can also hook yourself up to uh, an electrocardiogram. Now, originally, uh, the machines were made in Germany and they spelled cardiac with a K. So they call them EKG machines. But now, since we spell cardiac with a C in America, they're called ECG machines. But you'll still hear a lot of old people talk about EKGs. One of the things that we miss out on by not having face-to-face -face labs is you don't get to actually hook people up to an ECG and watch the tracings come out. But since we're online, we're going to learn about uh, where, where you would want to hook it up and what the tracing would look like once you got a, a reading from it. And hopefully you'll be able to look at the tracing and say, oh, that is not a normal tracing. And, oh, it must be something to do with the ventricles or it must be something to do with the um, uh, atria. I was really surprised to learn how much of our body is run by electricity. And you can hook the electrodes outside the person's heart and you can get the action potential and you can detect the current of the heart. And this is where they're hooking up a guy to, uh, the, the, to get brain waves. So it's called an EEG, electroencephalogram. And what we're doing in lab is electrocardiogram. But just to let you see the electrical potential, watch this little video. So they're hooking him up. And this is how they're going to get the brain waves. They're going to get the tracings. But this guy is able to also run an electric train by directing the energy to his skin. And you can see the tracings where he's driving the train. So amazing things that we can do. I once had a personal trainer and he hooked me up and he wanted to monitor my heart all the time while I was exercising to make sure that I was just doing cardio until I was strong enough and then we get into the more uh, physical types of um, exercise. And I know how to do biofeedback and so I would just talk to my heart because you can override the EKG or ECG yeah, just like that guy did with the electroencephalogram. And so I could make my heart slow really, really down or speed really, really up. And it, he'd get so upset with me. He'd say, quit doing that. Quit doing that. So anyway, again, if you ever get the opportunity to play around with an EKG, you can really play around with it. A couple of things you're going to want to remember. You're going to be learning arteries and veins. And in this book, they always color the arteries red, and they always color the veins blue. So unless you're colorblind, that should be a pretty um, good clue as to whether you're looking at an artery or a vein. 
The other thing is arteries carry blood away from the heart and the veins merge back from capillaries to venules to veins and then dump back into the heart. So they come back to the heart. Veins to the heart, arteries away. Arteries away. I'd like to make a point while you're looking at these pictures because I hopefully will save you from messing up on any quizzes or exams that you have. So if you are looking at these, let's look at the right common carotid. All right, if you reach out and touch the screen, you're going to reach out with your left hand to touch the right common carotid, and you're going to touch the left common carotid with your right hand because you are mirrored facing this guy or girl. It's kind of hard to tell with no skin. So be very careful when you're looking. Now on this one, if you can see the heart pointing off to the left, then that would help you out. But here you can see just part of the heart, and then you can see the aortic arch coming out and over. So you know that that's off to the left. So there are some clues that will give it away, but your first instinct is to say, well, this is on my right side. Excuse me, this is on my left side, and uh, so this is going to be the left, and it's not. It's the right. So be ever so careful about that. So there's a number of arteries that you should know. Luckily, the facial artery is in the face, so that one's going to be pretty easy. And the temporal artery is in the around your temple. So that, again, shouldn't be too hard. And you're coming off from the heart. And you should definitely know the three branches coming up off of the heart. So you've got your, your right common carotid, your left common carotid, and your left subclavian. Subclavian is going to go below your clavicle. Sub, like submarine, goes under the water. Sub goes below the clavicle. So hopefully these shouldn't be too hard for you. Now the brachiocephalic, that one is going to go up to the brain, but it's also going to go off and down your arm. So it's going to branch. So it starts out in, uh, going in one direction and branches off and goes two directions. So they name both directions that it goes. So those, hopefully you won't have too much trouble with those. And again, if they're pointing at the red thing, it is the artery they want you to name. Like here they say facial again, but they're talking about the facial vein here because they're pointing at the blue. And here's the facial artery right there. So be careful of your color and be careful of whether you're on your right or your left. And then you have a temporal vein, just like you have a temporal artery, and your internal jugular veins. If you watch any kind of TV, they're always slicing somebody on the neck and cutting through the jugular vein. And of course, if you do that, they just have time to do a few gasps, maybe tell you where they hid the money or why they killed the person, and then they die. So you don't live very long if somebody cuts your jugular. This picture is a little bit easier to detect things on because you can see the heart and you know that it's pointing to the left. So that's going to help you a little bit there. And we saw the left subclavian. Now we're looking at the right subclavian. It's going to go out under the clavicle and then come on down. And you notice that these things, it's kind of like if you've driven around in Lexington, you're driving along on, say, Harrodsburg Road, and all of a sudden it's Broadway. And then you continue driving on Broadway, and it changes its name again. So depending on where you are and whether you've branched off or not, a lot of these are, are names for the same thing that branched off. So your axillary is un, in your armpit. It's going to go in your armpit. The radial artery, that's the one if you come up from your thumb, then you're going to be above the radius, the bone. And, and there's your radial artery. And then the ulnar one is over 
on the other side. So if you can see the person with their hand, now this would be really nice if they would have the thumb. So you can see the person's thumb right here, and then you can see their fingers and the little finger here, so that you would know if you're coming down over the little finger, you're on the ulnar side, and if you're coming over the thumb, you're on the radial side. So what you're going to have to do is remember back to the first uh, lab where you learned what the proper stance was, the proper anatomical position, and so you're standing there with your with your palms facing forward and your thumbs pointing out laterally. So hopefully that's going to help you remember which is the radial and which is the ulnar. And brachial, we saw the brachial on the other one. This is the one that is going to run, run down your arm. So you've got your brachial, axillary, radial, ulnar, and right and left subclavian for your arteries. And the veins, they want you to know the right subclavian, the axillary. The basilisk, that one is different. The cephalic, you're like, wait a minute, the head's up here. What's that about? So what is it called cephalic down here when the head's up there? And the median cubital. So you remember the cubital region is your elbow, and the antecubital region is the inside of your elbow, and the median cubital would be closer to the body. Median is closer to the body, and lateral would be away from it. We don't have any lateral ones here. So sit and practice. Look at the branchings. All right, here's a few more. Now, nicely, most of the arteries and veins are named after the organs that they come in or out of and the areas of the body. So that kind of helps a lot. When you see the word hepatic, you know that it means liver. So this one is going to be the one supplying the liver. Splenic. It would be so nice if the organs were there too, but they, they don't have the organs. So you kind of have to orient yourself between the heart, maybe in the pubic region, and figure out where each of these organs are. Now, we saw the aorta come out of the heart, and we saw it arch over, making the aortic arch, and then it descended. So here we're looking at the descending aorta, but it's kind of hard to tell what's going on because they've taken away the spinal column, so you don't know exactly where it is with reference to that. But if you see one huge artery coming down, that's the aorta. And then it's going to branch off, and now we're in the iliac. You have an internal iliac here branching off, and the externals out here, and remember that your knee area, the back of your knee is called the popliteal area, and here is your, in this picture you see the person standing in the correct anatomical position, so you see the thumb and the little finger the way it's supposed to be which would have been nice in that picture before, but you could just imagine the hands coming out this way. Now, coming down here, you have to kind of look carefully because anterior means on the front. Well, I can tell because the hands are pointing this way and the feet are pointing this way, that this is the front of this person, not the back of this person. And so you have your anterior tibial and your posterior tibial artery. So this one is going down into the back, and this one is going down into the front. So anterior means front, posterior means back. I think one of the prettiest sounding uh, veins is the saphenous vein, and they're not sure exactly where it came from. They, it could be Greek, meaning to be clearly seen, because it is a huge vein. Or it could be Hebrew, 
which means hidden or covered, or it could be Arabic, which means deeply embedded. So all different uh, uh, der uh, derivations or etymology have been claimed for it. But anyway, I just think it sounds kind of neat. Now, remember, your veins originate away from the heart, and then they come up, and they come up until they finally dump into the heart. So the uh, saphenous vein starts from the dorsal vein of your big toe, the, big, the name of your big toe is your hallux, and then it goes on up through the arch of your foot, and it comes on up. So by the time you see it on your picture, it's already come up from the foot, and uh, we intercept it here as it passes close to the genital region and comes on up. And then it, it joins and joins and joins and finally makes it to the heart, the superior and inferior vena cava. On this one's going to be the uh, inferior, obviously, because it's coming in from the bottom. Uh, let's see. External iliac. If you put your hands on your hips, like you're going to be mad at somebody, that's your iliac region. And again, with no bones and things, it's kind of hard to tell where things are. But there's your external iliac. Your renal is going to be your kidneys. And, of course, we know the superior and inferior vena cava. So there's the inferior one. Look at that saphenous just come right on up there and join up. And then, of course, there's your superior, which is not labeled in this picture. So you have this list, and it tells you these are the arteries we want you to know, and these are the veins that we want you to know. And just looking, temporal, okay, that's over your temple. Facial, that's your face. Jugular, that's in your neck, where people are always slitting people in the neck. The inferior and superior vena cava, we know those are the ones that dump into the heart. Subclavian, you know that's going to go below the clavicle. The axillary is going to be under the arms. Now, remember the cephalic. That one was a little bit of a trick. So I went over and looked around in the Internet, and cephalic does mean the head, and the vein runs up the shoulder towards the head. So that's a little confusing because I would have thought, if I were the one naming things, that I would name a vein coming out of the head the cephalic. But anyway, it's a superficial vein of the upper limb, and it's one of the two main veins of the arm. So that's nice. You only have two main veins there. It's the source of blood for most blood tests. So that's a good thing to know. The other thing that I found that was kind of interesting that makes the cephalic vein so important is if they're going to put a pacemaker in you, they have to thread the leads in and attach them. So... Uh, some of the one of the leads they can put in is through the um, cephalic vein. So they they may try the central veins in the body, or they may try the cephalic vein, or a, a venous catheter to deliver medication and drain bloods. So if you're in the hospital for a very long period of time and they're having to draw blood constantly from you and they're constantly having to inject you with meds and things like that, sometimes they'll in install a port. So instead of going and sticking and jabbing and trying to find a vein every time, they've got a nice port open. When they install a port, here's a picture of a port right there, they may leave it for years or if you finished chemo or why ever it was that you had to have the port installed then they may remove it again going into the internet the basalic vein is a large superficial vein of the upper limb that helps drain the hand and the forearm it originates around the ulnar side of the dorsal venous network of the hand all right, so dorsal is the back of your hand, the ulnar side. The ulnar side is towards your little finger. So it's going to come up from there and drain upwards. 
So these two probably are going to be the hardest for you to remember and to find. Uh, but if you can remember the hand, then you ought to be okay. And the median cubital, remember lateral is outside, medial or median is in the middle, in the inside towards the, uh, like where the, your pubic region is in the middle part and your hips uh, are in your uh, lateral or outer part. So median is towards the inside of the elbow region. Hepatic, liver, splenic, spleen, renal, kidney. Looking at the arteries, these are the ones that are going to be running along the tibia. You've got one in the anterior and one in the posterior. You have one around the knee, in the back of the knee. You have one running up the femur. That one's going to be really easy to find. The internal and external iliac, you're going to have to stare at that a little bit. So while you're standing there looking at it, put your hands on your hips and say, okay, that's the iliac. I've got my hands on the iliac crest. And then, just to make it more fun, you have the common iliac. So the internal, external, and common. And the brachiocephalic, we talked about that one because that one's one of the biggies coming off the aorta. And you have the aorta ascending, arching over, and then descending. So it's the same, it's the same artery, but they name it depending on which direction it's going. So that one should be fairly easy. Oh, and look at this, renal splenic hepatic, renal splenic hepatic. We're seeing a lot of the same stuff. Now here we have the ulnar and the radial arteries. So radial thumb, ulnar little finger, brachial upper arm, axillary armpit, left and right subclavian going in and underneath the clavicle, and your carotids. So just don't get your left and your right mixed up because it's not your left and right. It's the person on the page is left and right. And then the facial and temporal. So I don't think you'll have any trouble. It looks like a lot of stuff, but you just need to stare at it and think about, okay, what's in this region? And you should be just fine with that. Don't forget to answer the five questions that are the pre-lab for each lab. So we're on, I'm talking about lab three right now, and lab three has two parts. If you cannot get it to work, we've switched these over to multiple choice. We put them on Blackboard. So if you can't get this to work, then go ahead and answer them and uh, email them to me, and I'll hand grade them and enter them. But you should see if you can find the ones that are um, in Blackboard that are multiple choice because they're easier. When we do face-to-face -face labs, we actually lay out models showing the veins in the arteries, and you would move from table to table, and you'd go to station one, and you would name each blood vessel, and then you go to the next table, and you would name each blood vessel. So they've taken all the ones on that list that we were looking at, and they scattered it out over five different tables. But since we're doing this online, then you're obviously not going to be walking around. We're just going to put pictures for you to look at. So the second half of the third lab, we're going to look at the heart rate and the sounds at rest, as well as what your heart is doing after you work out. Here is a video. They want you to watch this. This is Khan Academy. And this guy's a really cool person. Uh, he started out helping out his niece who was having trouble with algebra. And he started working the problems with her. And he would just draw them out and talk about them in just a matter-of-fact way. And she said, well, would, would you film this uh, and put it on the Internet, on YouTube, so my friends can see it? And uh, Bill Gates found it, and he had his kids learning from it, and he gave... Uh, the Khan Academy, I've forgotten a million or a million and a half. Google discovered Khan, gave him another million or a million and a half. So he, he has kept on making his little explanations for all of math. Uh, he took on physics. He's taken on a lot of subjects. So if you want just somebody who will explain it and draw it out for you, this, this Saul Khan will do it for you. So you should probably stop my tape go watch this, and then come back. 
So in the lab, we have an ECG machine, and they want you to place three electrodes, one on the medial side of the right wrist. So have the person stand with their thumbs pointing out and put it on the, the inside of the right wrist. So that would be coming up from your little finger. And then the medial side, upper right forearm, distal to the elbow. So you want to be away from the elbow on the upper forearm. And that's where you're going to put the green lead and the medial side of the upper left forearm. So you're kind of making a triangle. And the heart should be in between the, in the, uh, between the triangle. You should get a tracing PQRST on the oscilloscope screen. And they want you to measure how long it takes to go from P to R, how long the QRS interval lasts, and then what the QT interval is. And we know what it should be. These are the ranges that it should be. So here's a nice tracing that you can look at from, I got it off the internet. Here is your P wave. And then you have hyperpolarization, and then you go way up on your QRS. And then you come back up and you go to your T. So there's a P, a big QRS and then a T. So they want you to measure these intervals. What's happening under the P is the atria is depolarizing, both of them, right and left. Then they repolarize. So depolarize is their, the electricity is running through them. And then once you have let the electricity run through them, and now it's going through the AV node and down into the ventricles, you need to repolarize or recharge the atria, the left and right atria, so that they can be ready to depolarize again the next time the heart beats. And it's happening right here. So you have P, and then you have it repolarizing. But at the same time that the atria are repolarizing, both of the ventricles are depolarizing. And because they are so huge, so massive in comparison, their peak overwhelms. So you don't see the repolarization. It's right there. Now here's the depolarization of the ventricles, and here's where the ventricles repolarize. So the way that it kind of makes sense in my mind is when you turn on your iPhone or smartphone or whatever you've got, you use energy. So you are, it's like the heart is depolarizing and you're using up the electricity. Once your phone doesn't function anymore because you've used up all the electricity, then you have to go plug it in and recharge it. So the depolarization is where you're using the electricity and the repolarization is your recharging. So you always have to depolarize, repolarize, depolarize, repolarize. So that's what's going on. It would be nice if there were four peaks, but there's not. There's just three peaks. So you need to know what's going on at each of the peaks. And this is going to tell you, if something's wrong with this, then you know there's something wrong with the atria. If there's something wrong with this, you know there's something wrong with the ventricles. So knowing what the peaks are and what's happening to cause these deflections on the, the electrical tracing that we have here, the ECG or EKG, depending on how old you are. Uh, so make sure that you know those. So the next thing that you're supposed to do is go find a tracing if you have sinus tachycardia, which is your heart is beating too quickly. And one of the things I like to tell my students on the nursing exam, 
one of the questions they used to ask, I don't know if they still do, but they say you have a patient that has a heart rate of between 130 and 140. Is this considered to be tachycardia? And of course, your impulse is to say, well, of course it is. Because, you know, our heartbeat should be anywhere from 60 if you're an athlete all the way up to maybe 100 if you're kind of a couch potato and out of, out of shape. So, you know, 130, 140, oh my gosh, that is way too fast. Well, you have to ask, oh, is it an infant? Because babies normally have tachycardia. But for them, it's normal. So it's not considered tachycardia. So you have to know the age of the individual who's tracing that you're seeing. And I thought, now that is so unfair because, you know, your gut thing is like, oh, 130, oh, whew, way, way too fast. So you would write a time down here and you would do your P Q R S T, P Q R S T. And you would realize how many you would have to do for, for one minute. 130 of those in one minute. That's a lot. Now, bradycardia is below 60. So you're going to have much more uh, drawn out. It's going to take longer to do the P, the QRS, and the T. So I went out on the internet and found you a picture. This is what you normally, here's your P, Q, R, S, T, P, Q, R, S, T. That's normal. Here is bradycardia, excuse me, bradycardia, P, Q, R, S, T, wait for it, P, Q, R, S, T, wait for it. So your heart is beating too slowly to keep your body functioning very well. And then tachycardia, look at the interval here. From here to here is like one, two, three, four of these blocks. And down here, oh man, they wrote on it. You have one, two, and a half blocks. One, two, and a half blocks. So you can see that it's coming along. So you still have your P, Q, R, S, T, P, Q, R, S, T, but they're just smushed together. So you don't have this interval between the P and the T, or excuse me, the T and the P. So there you go. Here are your three. And you wouldn't be able to tell which is which unless somebody's giving you a time here. So if this takes a full second to go from here to here, then you know that there are 60 beats per minute. So that's going to be slow. And this one, if you could, if you knew your time and you see, wow, that's like 120 beats. So you have to do the math. How long did it take to get from here to here, from here to here, and how many of those could you do in 60 seconds? So a little bit of math going on there. Or if somebody shows you all three of them, you go, which one is bradycardia? That one. Which one's normal? That one. Which one's too fast? Tachycardia. That one. When, when everything is doing correctly, your heart's doing what it's supposed to be doing, then you're having your atria depolarized because of the sinoatrial node. Then it goes through the AV node, and it goes down the septum, and then it goes out the Purkinje fibers of the uh, ventricles and causes the ventricles to contract. Sometimes you have a hyperexcitable region in the ventricles, and they don't wait for the signal to come down the bundle of his and branch out through the Purkinje fibers. It's just like the kid who's jumping lines. Like, no, no, I can't wait, I can't wait. I gotta go to the front of the line and jump in line. So some of the cells in the ventricle start to depolarize before they're told to. And then all the rest of them try to depolarize and you just have this great big mess where you have some of the some of the heart trying to beat at one rhythm and some of the heart trying to beat at another rhythm. So you have fibrillation. 
And, and uh, if the doctors are actually looking at it, they say it looks like worms are crawling around inside of your heart. So that's kind of a, a weird thing. And if you have fibrillation, you're going to put paddles on the person and you're going to depolarize the whole heart. It's just like, it's like yelling at it and say, okay, everybody stop doing what you're doing. And then hopefully when the whole heart repolarizes at one time, everything will start going back. The sinoatrial node, the atria, and then the AV node, then the bundle, Purkinje fibers and ventricles contract. So that's the way it's supposed to go. So they want to know what does it look like if somebody's heart is squirming around like a bag of worms. So that's V-fib or ventricular fibrillation. And if you don't fix it, the person's going to die. This one should be pretty easy to detect. Do you see the P, the QRS, the T? This is just a mess. So if you see someone's heart doing this, you know that it isn't, it is, it is not beating correctly. The next irregular tracing you need to know uh, what it looks like is the atrial fibrillation. So if the atria are not beating as one, you're not gonna have that P wave. So remember the P wave is the atrial depolarization. But because it's getting all sorts of mixed messages, it's beating all over at different times. So it's not going to show you that wave. So let's see what that looks like. It always helps to have a normal tracing so that you can compare an abnormal tracing. So here is P, QRS, T, P, QRST. Up here, no P. It's just blah, 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 a mess. But the QRS looks fairly normal. And then you come out of here, and this is a bit of a mess. So what you're having is you're having the repolarization of the ventricles, but because the atria are, are depolarizing and repolarizing irregularly, it, it obscures it. And that's called AFib or atrial fibrillation. Okay. The next two tracings that you're required to know and be able to identify on an exam is a first degree heart block. So you've got the AV node working okay, the atria contract just fine, but you have a problem getting the signal to go through this sinoatrial node. So some, some damage has been uh, caused in this area. And so it, it's kind of, you're trying to get it through the SA node and then get it to the ventricles so that the ventricles will contract. This is a nice one because it tells you a little bit more about first degree heart block than just what the tracing is. The rhythm is going to be regular. So you're going to have, like, if you're doing 60 beats or 70 or 80 beats per minute, that's what you're going to have. So your rhythm is going to be regular. But what's going to look weird is the PR interval. So here's your P, and then you wait, and then QRS, and then T, and then P, and then you wait, and then the QRS. So that's the giveaway. You should have this, the P, and then almost no space, QRS, and then T. And you have this long, long time. So it's trying to get through the AV node to get down to the ventricle. The next thing you're supposed to be able to do is the premature atrial contraction. Now what's going to happen there, you know that premature is before you meant it to happen. So you're going to have the atria contracting, that, and remember that's the P wave, 
uh, much earlier, earlier than it should be, and it is going to have a weird shape. It's going to be not that nice, smooth hill that we're looking at. And it says, this condition is seen with frequent coffee use. So it's not life-threatening because there are a lot of people that drink a lot of coffee, but it will make your ECG look funny, and it might make you feel a little funny, kind of feel a little flutter. So when things are going the way they're supposed to, remember we get that nice smooth P and then the QRS and then the T. Well, the reason you get the nice P is because the sinoatrial node tells the atria to contract. But if they are not paying attention to the, the signal and they beat to a different drummer, I guess you could say, we call it an ectopic. So something other than the SA node or the AV node is powering the heart. There's a, a hyper excitable part of the heart that's causing it to beat. So in that case, probably the caffeine and the coffee had a little bit of something to do with it. So you're going to get a really strange wave. The QRS is still going to be sort of okay, QRS. But look at that. I mean, you're getting you're getting uh, uh, an upside down thing going on there, and upside down thing going on there. So you're getting some odd stuff because remember when we were looking at a normal one, I said underneath the QRS, that's when the atria repolarizes. It's when it recharges itself. But it's, if it's beating not through the SA node, but by some ectopic area in it, then it's going to repolarize at a different time. So you notice the QRS isn't as tall because you don't have the both uh, waves combined. So hopefully this is going to help you with the atrial contractions, the uh, premature atrial. Here is premature ventricular contraction, or PVCs as they're called. And people who have them say, oh, I'm throwing a PVC. Some people throw a lot of them. Some of them just do one every now and then. I'm one of the ones who does one just every now and then. But what's interesting is a lot of times when you do a PVC, it makes you cough. So you're just going along and your heart kind of feels funny and then you just go. <coughs> and it's, it's like, you know, a fake cough. But you didn't, you didn't plan to do it. It just kind of popped out of you. So this is what you're looking at an irregular rhythm. So... And you, here, this person's just normal. Look at that. P, Q, R, S, T, P, Q, R, S, T. And then all of a sudden you get this prolonged Q, R, S, greater than 0.12 seconds, wide and bizarre. <laughs> okay. And then it goes way down here. Normally it never goes that far down. So when it is repolarizing, it starts doing some weird stuff right there. It it goes way too far, and then it comes back, and look, there you go again, P, Q, R, S, T, P, Q, R, S, T, everything's just fine again, and then all of a sudden, here's your P, and then look at that one, now that is just weird, what's going on there, we're not going way up here, we're going down here, repolarizing, and then there goes the heart normally again, so that's what a PVC, and this person had two PVCs in one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight heartbeats. So basically one out of four heartbeats, he's throwing a PVC or she's throwing a PVC. So electrical irritability, it could be isolated where you just have one, or you may start having two or three and then everything's fine, then two or three. So they can be in clusters. And there is no treatment for it. You don't need to worry about it. It just happens. It's kind of a normal thing. 
If you have too many of them, however, then you may have uh, a problem with ischemia, which is they've shut off blood flow to part of the heart, so that's not any good. Or if you have some progressive heart disease that's going on where your heart is dying, then that can cause you to have some PVCs too. But most of us have them, may make you do that little <coughs> cough, and you go on. But you can definitely feel it. So a myocardial infarction, myo means muscle, cardial means heart. So part of the heart muscle died. It lost blood and there was not any oxygen coming in. The tissue died. So obviously that part of the heart can't beat correctly. So what you're going to see, <clears throat> excuse me, is the ST elevation. So P... QRS, but it doesn't come down, it stays up and goes to the T. And the P is not really a great P, but it's, it's there. QR, and then you have the ST elevation. So look for that in a myocardial infarction. And I have to tell you a funny, the, a lot of times people who haven't had classes like you're having don't know what these things are. So the doctor pulled this lady aside and told her he was very sorry that her husband had died of a myocardial infarction. And she, you know, cried and went back over to her relatives and they said, what happened? What happened? And she said, he's dead of a massive internal fart. That's what the doctor said, a massive internal fart. So that's it for lab three. I hope you look at those tracings and be able to tell which one is which and maybe trace them out on the paper.